Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. I could make another joke about being high again, but instead I'll continue on my uh, journey recapping Njal Saga for you. So Gunnar has died, and now some of the players in the saga that we met in our last video will go abroad. Throwin Sigfusson, who is uh, Gunnar's uncle and uh, married to Hallgerd's daughter Thorgerd by Hallgerd's second husband Gloom, he goes abroad and uh, earns the friendship and respect of Hokon Jarl, the ruler of Norway at the time. Meanwhile, Grim and Helgi Njalsson also go abroad. Their trip doesn't go so well at first. They're on a merchant ship that gets uh, lost in a bad storm and winds up off of the uh, Scottish Isles. There, they're attacked by Vikings, but they are rescued by a Hebridean Viking named Cory Solmunderson, who will become their great friend. Meanwhile, back in Norway, we, where uh, Throen is, we get a long digression in the saga about an individual named Hrap. Hrap is a really shady character who uh, betrays just about everyone that he's associated with. And to make a long story short, he is fleeing from the justice of Hokon Jarl when he finds himself on shore uh, in uh, the Trondheim area, the old capital of Norway, where some ships are about to depart, and one of those ships is Throin's. Well, Hrap comes up to Throin's ship, begs him to uh, take him on and protect him, because in a sense, someone coming to your ship is sort of like someone knocking on your door and is due some kind of protection and hospitality. Well, Throin uh, doesn't want to aid him. He looks like a shady kind of character, but hospitality being such a central tenet of the culture, he's finally pressured into doing it. He takes Throin onto the ship and hides him in an uh, in a, a, a ale barrel that uh, is put overboard, still attached to the ship with a rope. A Hulkon Jarl, who has been pursuing this outlaw, comes to the ship and asks Throin if he's seen the outlaw. Throin says that he is not. Hokon is suspicious, something tells him something's not right, so he searches the ship with Throin's permission, doesn't find the outlaw, goes back to shore, and then realizes, ah, there was that, that barrel, I bet, that uh, the outlaw is hiding in there. So he goes back to the ship, asks to see the barrel, but in the meantime, Throin has moved uh, Hrop uh, behind some uh, bags of flour on the deck, and so he's hidden there. Hawkon is still suspicious, but he goes back to shore, and uh, this time he goes, he thinks, you know, oh, there were those bags of flour on deck. I bet that the outlaw was hidden in those. So he goes back to Throne ship, but this time Throne has actually hidden a uh, hrap wrapped up in the sail. And so once again, Hawkon doesn't find him. Uh, Hawkon is still very suspicious, but he says that he would rather be, uh, be cheated than, than cheat. Uh, Throne by doing some harm to him without knowing that he is hidden an outlaw, and so Throin sails back to Iceland with the outlaw Hrap in tow. Later, when Helgi and Grim Njalsson have reached Norway, they are about to leave themselves after a uh, stay there when Håkon Jarl decides to punish them for their association with Throin, who betrayed him. They are tied up overnight, prepared to be killed in the morning, but they are saved once again, by Kori Solmunderson, who shows up in the nick of time. So Grim and Helgi Njalsson will return to Iceland uh, very angry at Thruin Sigfusson. And when they get back to Iceland, Kori will be married to uh, Njal's daughter Helga, becoming brother-in-law to the men that he uh, had befriended and uh, saved on a couple occasions. And the Njalssons will now begin sort of looking for a reason to kill Throin. Well, Njal knows that they don't really have a legal case for killing him, but he reminds them that if they were to hear some of the scandalous, insulting poems that uh, were mentioned in the last video that uh, Sigmund, Gunnar's cousin, had composed about them, uh, about how Njal has no beard, and about how his sons have to make their beards with manure, that that might be legal grounds for killing Throne.
Well, Skarpethen, Grim, and Helgen Jolson go to Throen's place, uh, along with Cory, their new brother-in-law. Skarpethen in the lead because he's the oldest, and Skarpethen knows what he wants to accomplish here. He wants a reason to kill Throen. So they show up at Throen's place, and there's Throen along with some of the other uh, miscreants of Gunnar's family, like Halgerd. Unfortunately, this is the last time we see her. Uh, she's one of the, the cooler characters, but uh, doesn't ever really get a send-off. And uh, Grani, Gunnarsson, is also there. Uh, unlike his brother Hogni, he's opposed to the Njalsons. And uh, Hrap, the outlaw, is there. Rumor has it that he's in a, a relationship with Halgerd, and when uh, Skarpethen and company show up, he and Halgerd are whispering to one another. But they get a silent reception. No one welcomes them, and so Skarpethen sarcastically says, Welcome to us. To which Halgerd replies, You'll never be welcome here. And uh, Skarpethen says, shut up, you whore. Well, this gets Grani and some of the other company there to start insulting them, calling their father beardless and them manure beards. And uh, Skarpethen just sort of takes it patiently and waits for everybody to say it. At which point, Throen seems to realize what Skarpethen is there for and try to get people to shut up and stop insulting them this way. But he gets pretty much everyone to say it except Throen himself. Eh, it's good enough. The family has slandered Njal and his sons uh, with an illegal slander, and so Skarpethen and his brothers right away. Well, not long after this, Beric Thora, their mother, hears from some traveling beggar women that Throen, Grani, and some others are uh, in the neighborhood. And uh, Skarpethen and his brothers, having heard this, they gather up their weapons and armor and go out looking for him. And the day is described not unlike this, a little cold, a little bit of snow on the ground, some uh, frozen rivers. And uh, they come to, so Skarpethen and, and his brothers and, and brother-in-law come to a, a hill and below them they see uh, a long frozen river, Throne and his company. And so they start running down to go and attack them. But Skarpethen, along the way, his shoe comes untied, so he pauses to tie it. And uh, once he, he looks up and he's ready to start running again, he sees that his brothers and brother-in-law are way ahead of him, and he's not going to catch up to him, so he's disappointed. But then he just ends up jumping onto the frozen river, and he just skates down, basically, on his, his shoes. And uh, as he passes Throin, who is who he and his company have moved onto the river to uh, make it a, a defensive position. As he passes Throen, he just slams him in the head with his axe, and Throen's teeth fall to the ice like confetti, I guess. I don't know what analogy to use for uh, teeth falling out of a broken skull. Anyway, they attack the rest of the men. I think this is one of the coolest uh, fight scenes in a saga. I mean, come on, the guy's skates past another guy on the ice and knocks his, his head in half. It's pretty metal, as they say. Well, they uh, kill the rest of the adults, but uh, Grani Gunnar son and another uh, relative on this side, a guy named Gunnar Lambason, uh, who were younger, they decide not to kill. They spare them, and uh, they go home. Well, Njol has to make some kind of settlement about this, uh, he ends up paying uh, restitution, compensation, monetary compensation to uh, Throen's family. This is particularly delicate because actually Throen's brother, Ketil of Mork, is married to another daughter of Njol named Thorgerd. And so there's incentive for both Ketil and Njol to try to make uh, compensation for this and not draw the two families into a feud. Njol pays over compensation to Ketil, and it so happens that he finds himself uh, well, it, it, this happens a, a little oddly. At, at first, um, so Thrawn is married to, to another Thorgareth, Thorgareth, uh, the daughter of Halgareth. And they have a son named Hoskuld, who is still young. He seems to be 10 ish or so when Thrawn is killed. Well, initially, Ketil of Mork adopts him and takes him to raise. But not long after this, Njal is visiting Ketil of Mork and sees this little boy. His name is uh, Hoskuld, Thrawn's son. And Njol says, who knows what possesses him to ask this, hey, Hoskuld, do you know how your father died? And 
uh, you know, I can't imagine having this conversation with someone, uh, you know, if my son had killed his dad. But Hoskuld says, yes, I know that your son Scarp having killed him, but that's all right. We have had compensation paid to us and we are at peace now. Njal is very impressed by this, as readers are too, probably. Uh, Njal says, well, your answer is better than my question. And he gives him a golden ring. And then he says to Ketil, I want to foster this boy. I want to adopt the kid whose dad my son killed. And so Njal adopts Hoskul Thronson. This is only moderately confusing because, of course, Njal has a son named Hoskul by a concubine of his named Hrothni. Well, this is probably going to turn out well, right? A man has adopted the son of a man that his son killed. I can't imagine an Icelandic saga uh, turning to bloodshed over something like that. Well, Hoskul grows up, and actually he gets along very well with Njal's sons. He and Skarpedhan are quite friendly, unexpectedly. And after a while, Njal, having this grown-up foster son, Hoskul, wants to arrange a marriage for him, just as he's arranged marriages for all of his other children. And he goes to a man named Flossi. Flossi has a niece named Hildegun, and Njal proposes that they marry Hildegun to Hoskuld. And Flossi is, he's a little suspicious about this because, of course, he knows that Hoskuld's father was killed by Njal's son. Uh, he, he, you know, the relationship is weird. Uh, Flossi tends to be kind of a, a genre-savvy person in this story. But he eventually agrees to the deal as long as Hildegun wants to marry Hoskuld. Uh, he's genre heavy enough to know that the girl needs to be willing uh, because, of course, we always see disaster whenever women are married against their will. Hildegun does not want to marry Hoskuld, though, for one reason. She says, you know, Uncle Flossi, you told me that you would only marry me to a man who was of the rank of Gothi, right, a local chieftain and judge. So Njal says, well, if that's the only objection, give me three years and I will make Hoskuld a Gothi. So they put Hildegun, the niece, on a three-year layaway plan, and Njal goes about trying to make a, a Gothi ship for Hoskuld. How he does this is, of course, one of his weird, devious plans. He goes to the all thing that coming summer, and he gives everybody terrible advice. He gives everyone such awful advice that all of their legal cases go awry, people end up killing each other rather than settling for money. Things go really badly. One year later, at the next all thing, He's starting to give people advice when they say, you know what, we don't even want uh, to, to bring this to law. We just, you know, we're just going to start dueling and killing each other. And Njal says, oh, well, that's, that's awful. Uh, you know, let me see if I can come up with some kind of legal solution to make you have faith in the legal system again. <laughs> the legal system I sabotage by giving everybody terrible advice a year ago. And so he and some other powerful men decide that what they need are, in fact, uh, more gothies in a fifth court. There are four districts of Iceland. They need to make sort of a, a fifth court uh, of appeals and that there need to be extra go these for this court. And so long story short, he ends up smooth talking everybody into making Hoskuld one of these new go these. And so now that Hoskuld, throwing son, foster son of Njal is a go -thie. he is married to Hildegun. And for a while, things go well. In the midst of all this, there is a long digression about the conversion of Iceland to Christianity in the year 1000. I won't dwell on this in this very short recap series of videos, uh, but it is told uh, with a fair amount of personal interest. It involves, for instance, characters such as uh, Thangbrand, who is the uh, missionary sent by King Olaf Tryggvason of Norway to convert the Icelanders, as well as Steinun, a uh, pagan a uh, woman who is a poet who has some uh, poems that she composes about how Thor and Christ dueled and Thor wrecked Thongbron's ship because Christ was too weak to fight him. Interesting stuff. Well, sometime later, Hoskuld Njalsson, not the Hoskuld adopted by Njal, but the Hoskuld who's actually Njal's son, is going to go visit Njal and he rides past the home of a man named Lütting. Now, Lütting is a son-in-law of Thrón and Sigfusson, and Lütting is upset because he has never received any sort of compensation for the death of his, his father-in-law, Thrón. Hoskuld Thrónsson, 
the Gothi is visiting him and Thrawn says, hey Hoskul, do you want to kill Hoskul and get something back for the death of your father? And Hoskul says, no, I don't want to kill Hoskul. <laughs> and he ends up leaving in disgust, but Lytton goes out with some other men and kills Hoskul Njalsa, not Hoskul the Gothi. And so Hrothni, Njal's concubine, or perhaps former concubine, she doesn't live with him anymore, comes to Njal with Hoskul's body and uh, Njal says that he wants to seek compensation for this, but Skarpethan and his brothers go out and try to kill Lytting. They actually don't succeed in killing Lytting. Uh, Lytting gets away, but they do kill some of his associates, and in the morning, Lytting goes to uh, Hoskul, Thrones, and Gothi, and, uh, and asks if he will make some kind of deal with Njal. Uh, he does. He pays off uh, Njal for the killing of his son Hoskuld, and for a while a tense peace holds. But at the next all thing, following the digression about the conversion of Christianity that I mentioned, a man named Olmundi, who is son of Hoskuld Njalsson, but is blind, goes to Litting in his booth at the all thing and says that he wants compensation for his father Hoskuld. Litting says he doesn't owe him any compensation because he already paid Njal, his grandfather. This upsets Almundi. He says that God wouldn't want this. Remember now they're talking about the Christian God though. Although of course, I mean, you know, to, to take a moment about this, it's not like the conversion of Christianity means that people's culture suddenly changes, right? I mean, they, no, the Bible hasn't been translated into Old Norse. There's really no preachers in the native language teaching anything other than the very basic facts, like, you know, the name of the new God is Jesus Christ. The, the, the culture doesn't change overnight nor does the conception of what God wants. So Almondy is leaving Litting's booth when he prays that God let his will be shown. And at this point, Almondy suddenly can see. So he runs back into Litting's booth and kills him with the ax that he carries. Because of course, this is Viking society, he's blind, but he still carries an ax. And as he's walking back out of the booth, he loses his sight again. So God gave him sight long enough to avenge his dad. Well, this is considered a pretty understandable killing. Uh, some compensation is paid, but again, the tense peace goes back to its default state of tense peace. All right, well, with that, I'll pause for this installment. And until next time, for beautiful Colorado, I'm wishing you all the best.